All right, welcome back. Uh, so just present the notes. OK, stay clear of the pride that comes with success. And this is a very common verse which we just read. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride is one of the most dangerous and destructive tool that the devil uses. You know why? Because pride is something that can be inside of us and nobody will even know it. Right? Uh, don't let pride creep in. You know, God has given us gifts, skills, and talents. It's wonderful. And the more we, you know, grow, we may put in a lot of hard work and grow in our gifts and skills and talents. And then God begins to open doors for us. And we get into positions where we know that we don't deserve to be there. That's the favor of God. But sometimes we forget about the favor of God and we let pride creep in. And the moment pride creeps in, it becomes dangerous and destructive. And there's so much that we can learn from scriptures, right? Uh, everything would have changed if King Saul had just said, okay, good job, David. All of us were getting scared, sitting back, but you went, here's what I'll do. Come, I'll teach you. From now, you have unlimited access into the king's table. Whenever you want, you come, you talk to me. It would have been a completely different story. But you know, the best, the, I wouldn't say best part, but the worst part about pride, it doesn't affect the other person. It affects us. And I've used this example many times, you know, people come up to us and say, hey, very good preaching or very good worship, done this. It's very, very easy for pride to come. I'm telling you, it's very easy. I mean, I'm not denying it. It is very easy for it to come in. But as believers, we must continue to walk in humility. This is where we can apply the letter of James where he says, what is your life? It's just a vapor. So we say, God, you know, I'm getting a lot of accolades. People are clapping for me. People are saying very good things about me, calling me pastor, reverend, most honorable, and all those things. But Lord, I want to walk in humility. And I know that all that I have, all that I've achieved, is because of you. One thing I always tell myself, anytime I, when I'm on stage, either leading worship or preaching, is I tell myself, this is not something that I can do on my own. It's not a, a skill that I had when I was small. And I developed that skill. No, it is nothing but the favor and the grace of God. And the moment we look at it that way, it keeps us in alignment. And sometimes we try to run after things that we want. It's good to be passionate, right? It's good to want to become a businessman or, or become a pioneer in the ministry. It's good. But don't let that, you know, Cause, cause pride to come in. Always acknowledge that it is God who is leading us. It is God. It's God. The very life that we have is because of God. And, and, and it all changes. So now, over time, I'm not saying it happened overnight, but now I've come to this place where whether there is an opportunity or no opportunity, I'm fine to sit, sit back and listen. Right? My identity is not changed. It doesn't change. Right? If there's a meeting and you know there are people preaching, I will not feel, hey, how come I didn't get? Initially, I used to feel that. I'm being very honest. I used to feel that, hey, how come I didn't? But I, over the years, I've come to a place where I said, if God has decided it, God will give me an opportunity. That's very simple. right? And, and so, I, it doesn't matter to me at all if people call me pastor, brother, sister. No, don't call me sister. Brother, 
all of those things it doesn't matter initially it mattered <laughs> you know let's say hey you know, firstly when they used to you know especially initially they started calling me pastor i used to feel oh man no <laughs> what is this they just call me paul and over time it became oh pastor so i'm so used to pastor <laughs> don't let it don't let it control your life don't, don't don't let it don't let all these things these are all minor things but the devil can use all of it to cause strife to cause anger resentment to cause shame inside you he can use all of this so come to a place where you say god whatever i do if it is sending books to the post office i will do it in an honorable way Because that is ministry. If it is in the marketplace, if it's something that I should do, where I should follow the rules, timings, there are things that I shouldn't do. Help me not to do it. Whether people are watching or no, stay clear of pride. Right? You, see, when you are small, when the church is small, or when a business is small, there is no pride. You will say, "Oh, I am just learning. I'm very small." But as you grow. it can easily come in so you you got to guard your heart right uh your personal income and benefits keep it right proverbs 37 through 9 two things i request of you remove falsehood and lies far from me give me neither poverty nor riches feed me with the food allotted to me lest i be full and deny you and say who is the lord or lest i be poor and steal and profane the name of my god right so as profits increase as ministry grows plenty of money is coming in it is perfectly fine to enjoy the fruit of your hard work it's fine if i spend a certain amount of money on my family on a vacation don't feel guilty oh i spent so much money oh you worked hard you are using the money to bless your family or even it's for yourself right but you see if it's needed right you don't be going and splurging and wasting money when it's of no use don't indulge yourself in success right for example you know uh, you're a business you're in business or you're in ministry initially in ministry you're riding a scooter then next you get a you have to buy a car that's good you need a car right uh, when you have a family you need a car you need see nowadays car is not a big deal it's not like oh god oh he's coming gone are those days nowadays it's like you don't have a car though. it's like it's a common thing and right? you need it it's a it's not a luxury it's an it's a need the basic thing nowadays maybe 10 years back it wasn't but now it's very basic and you look at the market also you anyone can buy i mean it's it's not very complex but don't indulge yourself so for example you work and then after 5 years you get your you know your business grows and you become so profitable right and you say okay now i'm going to go and i'm going to spend 1 crore on a bmw now that has four wheels the car that you have also has the same four wheels it's working fine you you don't need it you get what i'm saying right i always wondered you know I, I, i'm not judging but i always wondered how people in ministry are able to buy these you know, big cars and you know i i've seen it they have all these luxury cars mercedes benz and bmw and these are all i'm not talking about 50 lakhs and 60 i'm talking about 1 1.2 that's what the 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 value is and i used to think to myself how over indulging right and so i'm not i'm not saying oh, see many a times it's gifted to them so that's different right uh, many a times it's gifted to them uh and and it's that's a different story right the people bless ministries and i've heard i know of ministries pastors who you know there's this family who gifted their home this is yours it was a duplex house 
is, this is yours, boss. You prayed for my children. Now they are, you know, doing well. This is yours. And it happens. People are there who will give. That is a different story. But avoiding excess and there's no need. Learning to, you know, live it up to prove yourself among other people. You know, you don't have to do that. Even if I, if I have to come by bike, I, it doesn't matter to me. I, I can bike is good. Nothing wrong in it. There's no nobody is going to say, oh, you you're a pastor, you're coming by bike. If they say it is their problem because I'm not worried about it. I'm not thinking about it. <laughs> you are breaking your head on that. That's not my problem. My thing is, I can park easier, I can come faster, I have 100 other things. Sometimes I feel bikes are so convenient, scooters. But sometimes I feel when it's raining, oh, I wish I had it. <laughs> so it's good to have things that you require, but not overindulging. Right? You get what I'm saying, right? You need, you have, at the right time, God will give you as you keep being faithful. The better. You have better use of money than to spend it all on yourself. God has made you stewards of your, his resources so that you can carry out his purposes. There's always, you know, sometimes you say, what do I do with so much money? You can do so much. You can give to the poor. You can start, you can help, you know, the uh, children with no education. There's so much you can do. Right? I'm not, but I'm not saying, okay, give up all that you have and you know, just help. No, you know, have for yourself. Proverbs 25, 16, have you found honey? Eat as much as you need, lest you be filled with it and warm it. And it's true. Especially you have these beehives, if you keep taking in, it is extremely sweet. How many of you have taken uh, honey from the beehive? It is nothing compared to what we have in these jars. It is sweet, and you feel like going on eating it. But you know what happens? It, your stomach starts churning. Your stomach up, gets upset. And it's a problem. Eat as much as you can, and bless others as well. Multiply what you have by empowering others. One of the aspects of the kingdom of God is that it begins small, but it always grows into something big. When God prospers you and increases your business, your ministry, you have a greater and a grander purpose that God has envisioned for you. One of the ways to live out this purpose is to use what you have to multiply it for others. Empower people, providing education, providing good education, providing uh, you know, one of the things I really wanted, I desire is to help these blind children, right, uh, to study in villages, uh, blind children, they can study, you know, start these blind uh, centers where they can go and people can teach these blind children, they can learn, they can study, it's not like because they're blind, they can't do anything, no, you know, they can cross the road, they can do everything as they grow up, they just need education. They will learn everything they want they, that we can learn, and even more than that. How many of you know of Fanny Crosby? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Have you heard that song? Oh, what a foretaste. Fanny Crosby was a blind woman. She wrote 8,000 hymns. 8,000 hymns, blind. Now, picture if she was not educated. She was educated. Right? So you never know. God can use a blind person so wonderfully, more than a person who has four eyes. Right? So, so you empower others and bless them. Right? And through your funding, you know, you're able to uh, bless people in community. You're able to do so much more when it comes to ministry. Okay. Next one, the woman entrepreneur, the virtuous wife, mother, and the homemaker. Now, Proverbs uh, 31 is a very common pro uh, you know, text where we all say, we talk about the virtuous woman. And, and here, in this passage, basically it is, you know, whether you're a wife, you're a homemaker, you're a mother, you're in ministry, you're in business, 
whatever, especially to the women here, whatever you are engaging to do, make sure you find a balance. Make sure you find a balance. Just because, you know, you say, hey, I'm doing only ministry, doesn't mean that I must not be able to look after the home. Remember, you're also a wife or you're also a mother. Nobody can take a mother's place. And sometimes I, I keep, you know, thinking about this. Both my kids, the whole day they need me. They need me. They need to be around me always. The moment they are sleepy, they need their mother. I said, why not? Why? Why? I, I can put you to sleep. Come. No. Mama. But the whole day I was looking after you. I did everything for you. I fed you. I played with you. I played soccer with you. I played cricket with you. I sweated the whole day looking after you. I put you to sleep. No. I'll be sticking to their mother and sleeping. Nobody can take the place of a mother. A mother is a mother. A father is a father. So the whole aspect of this is no matter how high you become as a woman, right, a businesswoman or in ministry, remember that you are a wife, you are a mother, and you've got to fulfill those roles. Very, very important. These roles are important. And these roles are something which God has assigned. As a father, I have certain roles. As a mother, or as a wife, they have certain roles. So we fulfill it faithfully. Right? Okay. Let's get into the last portion. Any questions? Okay. We talked a little bit about workplace attitudes and how our workplace attitudes uh, transform the place where we work in. God has called us to be, to bring transformation. Right? What is transformation? Something that is already there, you change it. You transform it. Right? The butterfly, the cocoon transforms into a... Then it finally becomes a butterfly. But when you look at it first, it looks like, what is this? Right? The caterpillar... You can never picture it becoming a butterfly. But it does. There's a transformation, right? And when God, when we are God's children, God expects us to bring transformation wherever we are. He says, you are the light, you are the salt. How many of you tried eating rice without salt? The first bite you say, oh man, you missed up with the salt. It's happened to me many times. So, at home, okay. I, Oh man, before anyone complains, I missed to put salt. Sorry, put salt. Because salt is it's just a powder, but the rice is the same, the quantity of the water is the same, but that is what adds the flavor. It transforms the rice into giving it some taste. So, as believers, wherever we are, we're called to bring transformation. So, let's look at a few points on how we can be agents of transformation uh, in our communities, in our workplace. Initiate a culture shift. Salt, you know, Jesus is talking in Matthew 5, 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. Salt loses its flavor. How will it be seasoned again? It's then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Right? The Lord commissioned his followers. He says, okay, you are salt, you are light. Wherever you go, you will bring a transformation. Look at the life of Jesus. Did he bring transformation? Big time. Hey, why are you healing on the Sabbath day? You're not supposed to do that. If I was Jesus, I would have said, because you can't do? That's why you're telling me? You do. But Jesus says, he gives back a reply saying, if one of you have lost your sheep and they've fallen into a well, wouldn't you go and save it or you will wait after the Sabbath? Right? Jesus upset the apple cart. Uh, when you say upset the apple cart, means he he changed things. Right? He he upset the whole system there. 
He said, don't be like the Pharisees. Every one of the Jews and the, the regular uh, citizens of Jerusalem wanted to be like the Pharisees and Sadducees. Oh, they're so holy. Jesus is coming and saying, don't be like them. They are snakes. They are brood of vipers. They are only hypocrites. They stand in the corners and they show themselves as they're holy, but they're not holy. Jesus changed things. He looked at the Samaritan and he started speaking to the Samaritan. Hey, don't talk to a Samaritan. He's saying, the good Samaritan. No, I don't want to hear this story. He changed things. He brought a, a culture shift when, wherever he was. And that's what you and I are called to do. How can we do that? Wherever we are, if so, so for example, there's a company, there's an organization that you are working for, and everyone in that organization uh, you know, probably send false reports on timings or false exaggerations in their reports. But you can be a transformation, transformer. You can say, hey, I decide to put, I decide to be truthful. But for the last 10 years, this is what we've been doing. That's okay. I will change it. This is what I want to do. What are you doing? You're being salt. You're being a light. People may remember, see, sometimes people may not uh, you know, clap for you, applaud you. Remember, God is watching. And God will applaud. What is in secret? God will bring it into public. What is in the public, he knows how to do, how to handle it. Right? So when you and I do things the right way. Through godly principles, we are initiating a culture shift. Right? Uh, and I've shared this many times. There was this, uh, you know, when we were in hostel, it was 5 a.m. prayer. And I remember saying, hey, let's make it 4 a.m. The boys would be so upset with me. But what happened was, they would wake up only during exam time. 4 a.m. they're up. Why exams are coming? Right. But there was a shift. I'm not saying I brought that shift. But what I'm saying is when you set certain things, it can change. Things will change. Right? Um, and so you can be an influence where you are. Many of you are going back to your home churches, hometowns. Set a change. Your father and your father's father may have done ministry all these years, 50 years in a certain way. Make a change if you have to. I'm not saying go against them, but if there's a shift that you have to do, do it. Ask the Lord to lead you. People may not like it, people may like it. But if it's from the Lord, do it. Right? Initiate a culture shift. Secondly, create constructive change another parable matthew 13 33 another parable he spoke to them the kingdom of heaven is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was leavened Cons create constructive change in your workplace in your ministry using these principles in an environment where there is dishonesty where there is corruption where there is uh, you know, hatred, anger, jealousy. You step in, demonstrate integrity, demonstrate the love of God, demonstrate forgiveness, demonstrate love, kindness. And all of a sudden, you'll wonder, hey, what's happening? People may ridicule you and mock you. When Jesus was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Still, they ridicule them. Still, people ridicule Jesus. But it didn't affect who he is. He said, no, this is who I am. Forgive them, Lord. They don't know what they're doing. Right? In an environment of hostility and strife, demonstrate love and kindness. Dare to create constructive change. Right? Now, you look at very important is to look at areas where you need change. If you feel certain areas don't need change, they're going well, leave it as it is. But if you feel there are areas that need change, step in, bring constructive change.
right? Be a transformational leader. John 10, 11 through 14. Anyone can read, please. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd puts the sheep before himself, sacrifice himself if necessary. A hired man is not a real shepherd. The sheep mean nothing to him. He sees a wolf coming and runs for it, leaving the sheep to be ravaged and scattered by the wolf. He is only in it for the money. The sheep don't matter to him. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and my own sheep. Right. Know in, this, me. in this passage, we can bring about two things. There is a good shepherd and there's a hired shepherd. The good shepherd puts his life for the sheep. Right? So if a lion comes, the good shepherd will go and stand in front and say, hey, don't you know, try to attack the lion. He may not, he may be powerless or he may be weak compared to the lion, but he will he's willing to put his life down for the sheep. Now the hired shepherd is gonna say, run. Where is the first place where he can run and hide? Because it's not his. Right? He wants to live. But if it's your own, and you say, hey, what can I do? At least something. Let me take some stones and throw it or make do something to chase this lion away. I cannot run, you know, just turn back and run away. I cannot do that. But a hired shepherd will easily turn back and run away. I will explain, what will he go tell the owner? A lion came, I ran for my life. The lion say, the owner will say, hey, how come you didn't uh, just chase away the lion? You know, just take certain few stones, it'll go. No, 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 I'm scared of my life. But because he's a hired man. So two kinds of leaders, one who look for others. And there's, there's a other leader who looks for themselves. What can I gain? If I do this, that's not a good leader to be. That's not a good position to be in. We are called to look out for others. The whole basis of ministry is to bless people, to minister to people. Right? So we want to serve people and then get them to become leaders. A transformational leader sets out to transform. He brings positive change. He seeks to transform the lives of his people. He seeks to transform the lives of his customers. He seeks to transform the lives of his community. And he does all of this selflessly. We are called to demonstrate the kingdom in the workplace. The last point, let's read that portion. Acts 17, 16 to 17. Acts 17, 16 and 17. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Yes. Acts 17 is a wonderful... Paul's on his second missionary journey. He goes into Athens. He looks at what's happening around, and he reasoned with the synagogue, with the in the synagogue with the Jews and the Gentile worshippers. How do we translate it now? You and I, we have a lot of technology. We have a lot of things that are available uh, in our hands, tools, resources that are available, and so we use the tools. We gain knowledge, and we demonstrate that knowledge with wisdom that God has given us in the workplace. And Paul did that. When he stood, he reasoned with those in the synagogue. And if you read on, when Acts 17 gets over, he says, uh, he goes to, uh, uh, and he's preaching to the people in uh, Mars Hill, it, it, that's uh, the Aeropagus. He's preaching to everyone. And in the end of that portion, so wonderful, it says in Acts 17, it says, few of them believed Paul and followed him. Among them were some who were rulers of the synagogue. That was the church planted. All Paul did was he demonstrated his the wisdom and the, the, the tools that he had learned about. He demonstrated it through the, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. 
and he bought a transformation in that place. He was able to plant a church in Athens and do a ministry there as well. From there, he goes into Corinth. Right? So, so it's not that you know we we you know God has given us these skills, and it's not that we only say okay everywhere we need to open the Bible. There are times God says. Let's use the opportunities. We talked about this in lifestyle evangelism. Use what is around us to minister to people. Right? So it's a long journey, uh, and we've come to a close. Uh, any questions? Any thoughts? I don't throw away this book after you finish it. I keep reading it. You know, uh, I always have a hard copy with me. Uh, and uh, I keep using it because I have a lot of notes and I keep making notes on it. So keep learning these principles. These are wonderful principles. And you can use it both for ministry and for business or anything that you want for the workplace, right? You can use it. Uh, and I'm sure when you apply these principles, it just makes us uh, you know, more responsible. It makes us more fruitful for the kingdom of God, right? No thoughts, no questions? Everyone understood everything. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, so uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll close in prayer. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I really enjoyed teaching. I learned a lot personally. Uh, and I believe I'm going to also apply a few of these, uh, you know, made a note of a few things that I want to do. So, um, so I encourage you as well to keep learning, keep growing. Uh, thank you for staying the course for this uh, entire subject. Uh, let's pray, and we'll just uh, uh, bless each one of us when we close. What I'll also do is I'll put the final assessment soon, the stream. Uh, it's going to be a 50-mark test, and then you can just do that. And so to your total marks will be 400, 50 of the midterm, and 50 for the final assessment. OK? All right, would anyone like to pray? And close. OK, go ahead. Father God, we thank you and we bless you for this time you have given each one of us, Lord. Lord, everything you have taught us, Lord, give us the revelation and understanding to really apply in our lives, Lord. Father, we um, help us to be very fruitful. And uh, uh, people who will bring changes in our circumstances, Lord, help us to think that have that kingdom mindset, Lord. We submit each one of us unto your loving hands. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great uh, time. Have a great ho holiday as well. I'll see you next year. Meaning, I'll see you next when you are in third year, next semester. God bless you all. God bless.